Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's um, Oscars time. The Academy Awards are getting ready to play again. What famous movie that won Best Picture, an Oscar for Best Picture, when it takes place in the last century, starring Peter O'Toole and Omar Sharif, opens with a scene of an encounter at a well. Lawrence of Arabia, right, that's right, all right. What university in the southeast is known for the well it has at the center of its campus as a central meeting point? UNC, right, Carolina haulers out there, that's right. People have been encountering others at wells for a long time. It's not just an ancient practice. Um, they're still doing it, and we're still talking about it. Bill Wallace used to really uh, like the Bob Newhart show, and he especially liked the one where Newhart plays a psychologist, that sitcom series. And he really liked it when Newhart would be running a group, he'd be using group therapy and counseling them, and one of the members of the group would, in the caricatures of sitcoms, would start to engage in a behavior. Maybe it was whining, maybe it was complaining. Um, it was something that was just a bad direction for the whole group. And Newhart would deal with it outside of professional counseling bounds by suddenly just saying, stop it, stop it. And it just made Bill laugh. I think it was liberating to see Newhart give expression to something that all of us have probably understood the desire to say to somebody else, even though it might not be a best practice. Just stop it. The Samaritan woman at the well is not the negative foil in this story. I say that as much to myself as I do to you all, because it's a temptation and a practice to make her the negative foil in this story. It's a standard sermon move to treat her as a person of questionable character, for example, sermons entitled A Five-Time Loser, and to make this story about her sordid past and how Jesus welcomes her in spite of that. But recent commentaries, recent scholarship critiques that, and fairly strongly. It points out that neither Jesus nor the narrator in this text makes a pejorative judgment about the woman at all. We're bringing that to the story. We're inferring it or implying it, but Jesus doesn't do it. I think that's wrong, and I'm not gonna do it again. I'm saying to myself about that move, stop it. Just stop it. If you want to explore more about that part of the text, her relationships or the history of her relationships and what's being said there, then you can talk to Pastor Nicole or Pastor John because they've done study even this week about what's called the leviterate possibilities there. Or talk to Reverend Moringa or um, Reverend Hall about that. Uh, and that's a good place to go with that. But if you come to me, I'm just going to say, stop it. In general, stop talking judgmentally about people's personal and difficult histories. Stop it. Instead, I'm going to pile up some more facts about this precious story that's been so long and beloved in the life of the Christian community. Here in this story, we find the longest conversation that Jesus has with any single person in the Gospels. At least two times in the Hebrew Scriptures, there are famous scenes where someone meets their future spouse at a well when they come to draw water. Both of these may have come to your mind because you've heard of them before. They certainly would have come to mind of the first century Israeli readers and hearers. One is Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarah, who met Rebekah at a well. The other is Jacob, the Samaritan woman mentions him in the story, says it's his well. Jacob met Rachel at a well. And so, 
that's meant to be evoked for us as we hear the stories as well. It's like in that pathway, that sequence of encounter at well stories. Now, I'm not saying exactly what we should do with that. You're interpreters also, but I'm piling up the facts because I think it's just wrong to ignore it. What couple in our congregation encountered each other when they each got a ticket on a train and sat next to each other? Marianne and Joseph Velez, all right? We keep reading about encounters here, one with another, more facts. Two times in John's gospel, Jesus asks for a drink. The first is here in this story, and the second is on the cross when he says, I thirst. Who, still today, who typically goes to the water to get, goes to the well to get water? Who is it you're typically going to find in a community going to the well to get water? Women and children. They're the ones who perform this domestic task. I know that from the times that I've been in Popoli, Uganda, and Bamba and Kroshu. The people in Popoli get their water from wells that you help them build in large part so that women and children don't have to put their lives in danger by going down to the river where they're in danger from wild animals and other uh, issues along the way. The well makes them safer and is much more accessible. And in Mom Ben Krushu, the primary well in the community is right across from the hospital. And so you see the women and children there lugging big jugs of water, often on their heads, small children carrying heavy weights of water as they come together. If you go to get water from a well, what's the time of day that you're most likely to go and get water? Sunrise and sunset. This is a global phenomenon. Uh, children and women, you see them come to the well in both of those places as the day starts early. They're getting water not only for breakfast but for the family across the day and then they come back at the end of the day so that they have water across the night. But in this story, the they meet each other at the well at what time? High noon. See, it's a detail in the story, and, and it's meant to be seen because it's so different than the norm. What story comes immediately before this story in the fourth chapter of John? Immediately before it in the third chapter comes the story of Nicodemus. Remember? Because you looked at him last week. In Lent, we're going to get from John's Gospel encounters of Jesus with people along the road towards Jerusalem, Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman at the well, Bartimaeus, uh, Zacchaeus, others are coming. But here it's especially significant that in this fourth chapter we find a Samaritan woman and immediately smack dab uh, for it as a story is the story of Nicodemus. That's intentional. John means for us to hear and contrast the two stories. Back to back, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. The Samaritan woman comes to Jesus at high noon. Nicodemus is named. You still know his name. In the story, this person is not named except a Samaritan woman. Nicodemus is a respected leader. He's a Pharisee. She is a woman. And the disciples, remember in the text, are astounded. That's the phrase when they come and find Jesus speaking to a woman. She's not only a woman, but she's also a Samaritan woman. Jews and Samaritans, as the text says, do not share things together. Now, that might seem strange to you from this perspective, now, because the differences between them might seem very small from your perspective in this part of the world. And um, a metaphor, a bit hyperbole to describe how that is, I tell you, it, it's like looking at folks in Alabama and the energy they feel between the University of Alabama and Auburn University, right? <laughs> they are fierce about that. They can tell the distinctions powerfully. But to me, they're both universities in Alabama, right? They both are big on football and basketball and baseball, right? It seems like they have a lot in common. But for them, never the twain shall meet. Marvin Crabtree 
whose service is coming up this Saturday was the only person I ever have known who had a degree both from Auburn and the University of Alabama. He's the only person I saw the two streams meet and together. Jews and Samaritans do not share things in common, and unfortunately, they had a history of violence towards each other in it. Jesus starts this conversation. He starts it by saying to her, give me a drink. And she answers by pointing out the obvious, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And then Jesus moves the conversation, he moves it into a theological discussion, a spiritual one, and he says, the water that I will give you will become a spring of water gushing into eternal life. Water in the Gospel of John is very important. There's a lot of emphasis on John the Baptist. There's frequent talk about water. Jesus, it's in the Gospel of John that he turns water into wine. And now there's this conversation just in the fourth chapter of water gushing up that will keep you from ever having to be thirsty. And that's Jesus' shorthand here for a quality of life, the renewal and the sustenance that comes from being in relationship with him. And the woman, while she doesn't completely understand it, she moves forward with some boldness and says, give me some of this water. And then the story takes a different turn. And Jesus says, go back and ask your husband. And that's meant to be a reference, I think, to those two engagement stories earlier in the text. But here's what I want to lift up about this woman here. And I see two features in it that speak to her gifts to us today. One is her willingness to dialogue. She's talking to Jesus here, and she's already identified herself as someone who typically wouldn't be in conversation with him. But she begins to recognize something in him that Nicodemus, in the same conversation, didn't seem to understand at first. She's not certain, at least to read it, that Jesus is the Christ, but she doesn't let that stop her from talking with him, inquiring further, and finally going and inviting other people, her neighbors, into their own encounter with Jesus. She's not afraid to enter into questions about her faith with him. She trusts him with the issues of her faith. And she, she demonstrates what can happen when we're willing to trust God with our own questions, even our doubts about our faith. The woman at the well shows us that faith is about dialogue and about growth and change. She dialogues and she also invites. Even when she doesn't have all the answers, she invites others. Even when she isn't 100% sure about her biblical doctrine, she doesn't have something memorized to a creed here. She doesn't have a, a, a statement that she's assenting to. She still is willing to share this news about the person she met and her own wondering, could this be the Messiah with others as well? And we have to wonder when and if we will finally feel confident enough, secure enough, and knowledgeable enough to, like her, invite others to come and see. She's an example for us of an opportunity to dialogue about faith, even with God, and also an example of one who shares her faith with others, who invites others into that relationship. And I think that's why we have the story. I mean, we have to wonder, don't we, how it is that 2,000 years later, we still have this story. I mean, the intimacy of it, the length of it, the only reasonable conclusion, I think, is that she shared it with them. She remembered the story. It's her story. Uh, some scholars say this is an identity text. It's a text that shares how a whole community of people who began their entrance into the Christian church came through her because of her story and how it was important because it made it clear that they could be welcomed also even though they were not Jews, but rather Samaritans, even if they were women as opposed to men across races, across genders, she is a sign for how others are drawn towards and welcome for Jesus Christ. I think she's a hero for them, for the Christian community. And they remember her and what she was in terms of her own sharing, her evangelism. Tom Schumann, is a Presbyterian pastor who's a friend of Jim Reed and me, 
And he wrote a short poem about this text. I share a portion of it here. She dropped her bucket so she could dip her heart in living water. She set aside all her prejudices to be embraced by unconditional grace. She tossed aside all her theological arguments that the word might burrow itself into her soul. She let go of her past to be surrounded by her future. May she be our model when we meet you, O oh Lord, in coffee shops, in the grandstands of the pitch, in our Bible studies, in our book clubs, in our loneliness, in our pain, in our longings, in our brokenness, in our tears, in our thirst. Wherever we may meet you, thirsty for hope. So if you feel vulnerable and alone and maybe not welcomed in the community today, the text tells you Jesus is coming for you. Jesus is welcoming you. And as you go out into the week, be alert. Be alert in the places where you go, even in domestic errands, you might encounter Jesus on the side of a well. And if you see someone thirsty, give them something to drink. Give them a taste of hope. Water in the world is so important. I alluded to that in the children's sermon, and it's so accessible for us and so difficult for so many. It's not a creed in the PCUSA, but I invite you to share with me, reading in unison, a statement out of the Australian Reformed Church, a statement about water and where in it we meet Jesus Christ again and again. Read with me if you will. We believe in God the Creator, who created water for us in diverse forms, creeks and currents, springs and spas, ponds and puddles. Without this gift of water, we would perish. We believe in Jesus, baptized by John in the waters of the Jordan, and sent by God to bring living water to all people. This Jesus spent time chatting with a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. His contact with her so refreshed her that she was able to start life anew and in turn give new life to her community. We believe that our contact with Jesus enables us to do likewise. We believe in God's Spirit, which has the force of a thundering waterfall ready to be used to renew the world. We believe that God calls us all to work joyfully to create communities where the river of water of life gives fullness of life to all people. Amen.